thank you so much for having me. Good morning, everyone. I am in Central Time, uh, so it is actually almost noon here in Mississippi. Um, so I just really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you guys today and to share some information about implementation. You know, we talk so much about the reading science, uh, the science, you know, brain science, but there's also an implementation science. So this is where those of you, those of us who are boots on the ground, uh, take all of these things and, and put them into action. This is where, where a lot of the work happens, what we know uh, and how we're able to translate that to others and how we're able to support our teachers, our, our families uh, into making sure that these things really happen and that they happen effectively. Um, so for today, we'll just really talk about how much implementation matters, but also how you as literacy leaders serve as the catalysts for change. Um, so I'll first talk a little bit about some statistics, uh, you know, the impact of being a skilled reader or not, right, for, for those of, of our students who, um, who have not been able to be taught by teachers who were not skilled in, in the science of reading instruction uh, and, and what that does for our children and as they become adults, how that impacts our community. I'll also talk about uh, the literacy landscape of the nation. What are we doing as a country uh, around the science of reading and also ensuring that we are improving student outcomes for, for, um, for all of our children? And I'll tell a little bit about the Mississippi story. So for those of you who are not familiar with me, I am uh, the former state literacy director for the Mississippi Department of Education. And from 2013 until 2019, I led our state's implementation of the Literacy-Based Promotion Act. Um, we kind of caught national attention a couple of years ago uh, in 2019 with our NAEP scores as being the only state that had significant gains in reading. So I'll just talk a little bit about how we did that and the law um, and the specifications of that law that made it possible. And then lastly, we will talk about the critical role of you all as leaders and again, how you uh, really are the backbone to this work and how you make all of these things go uh, and, and go smoothly. So um, across the country, there have been several states that have adopted what we call comprehensive early literacy policies. Um, I'm gonna show a slide a little later with the landscape of the country uh, and you'll be able to see your state there. Um, some of you may already know the policies that your state has adopted around early literacy, again, or not, right? What the focus is. And so let's talk about why now. Um, these are statistics from, uh, you know, any Casey Foundation um, that you may have seen in the past because these are just very compelling uh, when we talk about this transition, this threshold from third to fourth grade, um, students transitioning from learning to read to reading to learn, and just how important that is. Now, the statistics uh, say that 88% of our students who failed to earn a diploma were struggling readers in third grade. Now, um, we also get to talk about some subgroup data. It's extremely important for all of us to understand that regardless of zip code, regardless of, of color, black, white, Hispanic students, others, that our students can learn to read. Uh, they have to have certain factors that are in place though. And some of those factors I'll talk about a little later, uh, but students who are not reading proficiently in third grade are four times more likely to not graduate high school. Uh, I was looking at something the other day and they were talking about the number of jobs that they had in their state. Um, and that out of 100% of the jobs that they had in their state that required a high school diploma, they only had about 43% of that population in the age to be working that were qualified for those jobs. So how can we ensure that we are not neglecting our students and that we are uh, making sure that they're standing in front of teach or sitting in front of teachers who are empowered um, to teach them to read? Um, 
If students are African American or Hispanic, they're six times more likely to drop out or fail to graduate from high school. And if low income minority are eight times more likely to drop out or fail to graduate from high school. Now, again, thinking about these subgroups, we also have to think about some of the other factors uh, that may be taking place. Maybe there's a um, lack of resources, you know, socioeconomic um, status, those types of things that we normally attribute to students from any type of subgroup for not doing well. But those things do not have to be um, that sole factor of how well our students are able to perform and also to participate in society. And there are bright spots um, where it, th these things are, are effectively uh, being remedied regardless of, of um, students, any other factors that the students may face. So this impact continues. Um, our students who are struggling in schools, they become adults who are struggling um, if their reading deficiencies are not remedied. Um, the US Department of Education states that more than half of US adults um, lack proficiency in literacy. Um, the Bush, Barbara Bush Fam Foundation for Family Literacy has also conducted a study that, you know, we talk a lot about reading, but you hear a lot about businesses that choose communities based on schools and how well schools are performing because they think about how they can attract workers and how they can attract their families. Um, but the nation could be losing up to $2.2 trillion annually due to low literacy rates. And then, of course, we know that this impact goes far beyond the classroom. Literacy, um, adults who are, are low literate they struggle to earn a living wage. Um, they can't really see themselves outside of their four walls or outside of their communities. You know, as we all know on, on this particular Zoom that when you read, you can imagine yourself in all of these other places, right? You can dream and you can think about places that you can go or, or careers or other things that you can participate in. So when a student, lacks reading proficiency. He or she is not able to um, really um, participate in the democratic process, uh, write, comprehend, read, all of those things that it takes for them to be, um, you know, just a successful citizen in our society. So what have been these most recent forces? Of course, the science of reading uh, and these revived uh, reading wars. You know, it's funny that you talk to people and they say, well, why are we arguing about phonics? You know, why are we arguing about these things? This is how I learned to read, right? Um, so when you get into, uh, you know, what has happened as of late, just kind of over the past five or six years where these reading wars have really begun to rage again, you'll think about the science of reading. And I always think about Emily Hanford. And I think about, uh, you know, when she began with her podcasts that, in this case, the audiences shifted. It was not just us having these conversations, you know, in the district or at our schools um, or at the state agencies. This was an opportunity for parents to listen to other parents who were saying that they thought their children were learning to read because they were bringing home books and um, they were reading. But then they realized as they looked more closely that they were really utilizing pictures to help them get through the book, or they were guessing at words. And sometimes parents didn't know that that was a bad thing, right? So when you begin to broaden uh, or expand the knowledge of those who are directly impacted by this, then you get, of course, those on the opposing side to say, well, no, this, this actually really works. But I believe that the science of reading and this movement toward ensuring that everyone knows about the science of reading has been a recent force behind a lot of policy that has uh, been passed across the country. And of course, dyslexia focused reform. You know, how can we ensure that we are getting the message out that the science of reading, structured literacy, that these are our practices that are also um, good, sound, evidence based practices for our students with dyslexia? Um, how can we ensure that we are banding together? Uh, and getting out that type of information 
we want to make sure that our decoding dyslexia groups across the country are able to have this voice and to also include the identification of students with characteristics of dyslexia uh, and other supports and accommodations that our students should be receiving, you know, in all of this legislation that's also being passed around early literacy. And then, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, are, are we out of it yet? You know, in some cases, um, we are not. In some communities, we are not. Um, but this interrupted learning for our students for really almost two years has made uh, a significant impact on our students, especially our youngest learners, uh, but also our families who were at home with their children as they were on Zoom or that they were you know, trying to learn online. Um, some of our parents found out some things about their children that they just didn't know. And they have been trusting the system and trusting the process. When their children come home with these grades and they're saying, okay, your child is doing really well. But as parents sat next to their children to help them with their homework during the pandemic, or as they listened as their children were online and trying to learn how to read, they realized in some cases that their children just were not ready. So now there have been parents and other groups, of course, as we've come out of this pandemic and as we've returned to more brick and mortar um, schools that are now asking a lot of questions about what curriculum are you using to teach my child how to read? What assessment are you using to identify if my child needs assistance with learning how to read or if my child has a reading deficiency? So the COVID-19 pandemic really did expose a lot of things and really kind of uh, just shine a spotlight on um, reading and how many students are still having reading difficulties. So as of 2021, now uh, this map will be updated this summer because we've had some legislation to pass this year. But as of 2021, this map reflects um, our states across the country that have adopted early reading or early literacy legislation. In my current role, I serve as the Senior Policy Fellow for the Foundation for Excellence in Education, which is Excel in Ed. And we support states uh, in either drafting new policies around early literacy or um, amending or, of course, strengthening their current policies around early literacy. And we have what's called fundamental principles of an early literacy policy. So what are all of the components that should be in a policy such as this? If you're looking at a comprehensive approach to early literacy, and I will go over those principles in a minute. But as you think about the shading of this map um, from dark blue to those that have a full comprehensive policy, of course, all the way to gray that for those states that have minimal or no fundamental principles. Now, you may see some of these states that don't have early literacy policies and you may say, wow, you know, these may be some of the states that are in the top 10 when you look at NAEP. Or these may be some of the states that are that have been historically doing okay. Um, you know, I always say that when Mississippi made the gains that we made on Nate, um, slow and steady, right? Um, that it had to be Mississippi because we were historically known as the state that um, was at the bottom, along with other southern states and some other states, and we were just always at the bottom, and everyone was okay with that, right? But when a state like Mississippi, the poorest state in the nation, makes gains, people begin to ask questions about, well, what is it that they're doing? What are they doing? But when you also look at these states that have historically done well, and now you get the opportunity to really, we say, look under the hood, and you see that their subgroups aren't performing as well as their white students are, or there's such this large gap uh, 25, 20 to 28 skill score point gap between overall how, how it looks on Nate, but then also how it looks then when you think about how we are educating our subgroups, you know, or even students with disabilities, students on free or reduced lunch, then you know that there are some things that have to be done. This year, um, already Virginia and Utah um, have passed early literacy legislation um, last year, North Carolina 
um, revamped their um, Read to Achieve Act and passed the, the uh, Excellent Public Schools Act um, to ensure that they were putting all of these policies and all of these principles in place. So you have to think about states that are now saying, okay, what we've been doing hasn't really worked. So let's make sure that we are, are strengthening that. And so why focus on the science of reading? And, and many of you who are here, you know, already know these things. You've looked at um, these, these next slides that I'm going to show and, and you've known them well, but there are some who, who are not, who, who have not. There are some who are just really on the line and saying, you know, I'm here for this conference today and tomorrow so that I can learn more about the science of reading. So with the reading wars, this is what we're facing. This is what our teachers are facing, you know, uh, and our, our children are really just saying, you know, I'm here. I'm going to learn how you teach me. But with teachers, uh, in some instances, you know, hearing about three queuing system, now knowing three queuing system is not what we want to do. Then hearing about phonics, whole language versus the science of reading, structured literacy, you know, are we using level text or decodable text? So all of these things can be very confusing for those teachers who are in classrooms with students every day. So this is why as a leader, and of course, as a literacy leader, um, it is your role to set the tone and to just be very, um, very specific about you know, the way in which your school is going to teach reading, your school, your district, your state so that our teachers are not saying, well, this is just one more thing that is passing through. And uh, you know, I'll be here when the next thing comes, right? So we don't want our teachers confused, our parents confused, and, and especially we do not want our students confused as to how we are teaching them how to read. And I'm sure many of you have seen this ladder. Uh, I love this revised and updated ladder from Nancy Young, uh, the ladder of reading and writing, and of course it includes spelling. Um, a couple of things to really pay attention to is of course that purple um, shaded area on the side that says that throughout this entire process, as we begin to talk about these different groups of students throughout this entire process, data must inform instruction and also the differentiation of that instruction. And then in the blue shaded area, um, that we are bringing our attention to the fact that there are linguistic processes and other factors that affect learning and that these factors may vary uh, within persons or groups, right? So we have to think about this and consider this throughout. In, in your schools, you know, if you're a teacher in your classrooms, um, you are going to have uh, a, a group of students or a classroom of students that may be reflective of this particular um, representation of this particular graphic. Now, we talk so much about students' deficiencies or these deficit skills that we really don't think a lot about how we can ensure that we are continuing to provide enrichment to those students, the five to 10% of students where learning to read seems effortless. The thing about these students or this group of students is that if they're not challenged, they may become bored, right? They may become disconnected. If, we're, if there's a teacher who's not well versed in how to dif differentiate instruction and that you're just spending entire, you know, whole group class time on trying to bring other students up to where they need to be, you have to consider these students and how these students must be challenged uh, in, in order to make growth and also to continue to be successful. And then you look at the other group for about 35% of our students, learning to read is relatively easy. Uh, and it says that um, structured literacy approach likely valuable. What this means is that if a child is doing well, that does not mean that there are not any areas in which a child should need uh, or a child may need additional support. So the child may need additional support in vocabulary, you know, or they may need additional support in fluency, you know, those types of things. So again, going along with 
um, what is, is evident in all of these areas is the fact that we have to use data to inform you know, what we're doing during our instruction. And then of course we have our students that must have explicit systematic code-based instruction in order to learn to read, in order to learn proficiently, uh, to read proficiently and in order to definitely master the, your state's standards, right? That we have to begin to provide this type of support. We have to provide interventions outside of the 90 minutes, uh, the up to 90 to 120 minutes of reading instruction that the intervention should be in addition to that. Uh, and that students should not be pulled out in, in instances where they are learning or being exposed to grade level material, that interventions must be intentional and they must um, speak to the students' lowest deficit skills and also address those. So I believe that adding spelling and writing and all of those things to this ladder, uh, the original ladder of reading, really shows us the holistic or uh, the comprehensive approach to, to understanding where students are so that we can address those challenges. And the simple view of reading, I'm sure has been uh, shared so many times, but the one thing about this uh, representation is that regardless of whether you're an elementary teacher and you went through a traditional teacher preparation program, or whether you're a secondary teacher and you are working with um, students who are adolescents who may be struggling to read, this representation is one that, it that reflects that it doesn't just take phonics. You can't just add phonics and, and, and expect students to have full reading comprehension. It's that language comprehension also matters and it equally matters is word, uh, word recognition. And those two form the product of reading comprehension. You know, if you walk past a classroom uh, and your students are just sitting crisscross applesauce in, in you know, these early learning classrooms and the principal say, oh, wow, that's a well-managed classroom, right? Uh, you must understand that students have to talk to each other. They have to talk to each other. They have to listen to each other. Uh, teachers also have to uh, make sure that, that children are immersed in language. You know, and I, we know that uh, Marion Wolf talked a lot about, you know, at home, you know, that children must be immersed in language at home. And that's extremely important. And as we shift those students into the classroom, we have to ensure um, that as those, as their educator, as their teacher, that we are also providing those opportunities for students to be immersed in language. And then also uh, requiring um, those opportunities where students are able to learn the other foundational skills. So what are these principles? Uh, and um, I'll use that again as kind of a backdrop to Mississippi's journey to improving literacy outcomes. So there has to be this interconnected system. If you are a part of any of the science of reading groups on Facebook or any other social media platform where there are teachers saying that, you know, they're the only teacher in their building that is really seeking out the science of reading and they're having to do that by pulling their own resources, or you're hearing the stories about, you know, very courageous principals and other district superintendents or leaders who are saying that, we're the only school or we're the only district that's really focused on the science of reading, but we're going to go forth anyway. Um, and then also when you're looking at your state departments of education or even your legislature, where they are saying that we're making the science of reading a priority more broadly so that we can have this comprehensive approach across the state. Know that all of these things must work together. Because you can't have the legislator saying that this is what we want to do with the Department of Education saying, well, you know, we're not sure about that. Or the Department of Education saying this is where we're moving as a state and your district and superintendents and your principals are pushing back on that. And again, it all goes back to the teachers, those who are standing in those classrooms every day. And we have to send a clear message and be supportive. So this was our journey, or this continues to be the journey. Um, our fundamental principles include um, first educator training. Our teachers must have the knowledge and skills to teach students how to read. Now, we adopted letters 
uh, for Mississippi, the language essentials for teachers are reading and spelling. And we rolled our training out in a way where we um, identified our schools um, who had the highest percentage of students who were below proficient and those teachers attended training first, right? So this was um, going to be a training that was required across the state, but we had to have a way in which we prioritized um, who would go first and, and which cohorts and how the cohorts would be uh, would begin. Now, you'll also see that this include educator preparation programs. Now, sometimes, you know, in educator prep, those professors say, well, you know, we have academic freedom. You know, we should be able to teach in the ways that we want. Um, you know, I have tenure, all of those things. But one thing that we do know, regardless of where you are in the country, all students are not, all candidates, pre-service students are not trained the same, even in the same state. There could be in the same state, different universities are teaching their candidates how to teach reading completely differently. So how can we develop this common language as to how to teach reading, except for through professional development? We started with a clean slate. The next thing is coaching for teachers. I will say in addition to educator training, this gave us the most bang for our buck. Teachers having coaches in their classrooms, supporting them with their transfer of what they learned in training to practice was extremely important. Uh, bonding with teachers, building those relationships, building the trust, um, and then also for coaches to not only have their knowledge, right, of how to teach reading, but again, also be able to communicate and um, support those teachers in a way that is non-threatening, non-evaluative, um, that really helped us to move the needle and it helped teachers to become more confident in how to teach reading. They had a thought partner, you know, in their schools, in their classrooms, and then also someone holding them accountable uh, for actually doing these things. That's also why being an administrator and also being an administrator trained in the science of reading is so important because of the accountability. Because if the expectation is that teachers learn the science of reading, there has to be an expectation and also support for teachers to really begin to make that shift. We can't send them to PD and then, you know, oh, well, you can try this next year. It has to be that there's an immediate expectation for teachers to begin um, to shift their practice to the science. So coaches are crucial. Also, early identification and testing with intention. Uh, you know, I um, spoke with a school district superintendent a few years ago, and they were talking about all of this testing. There's just so much testing. And, you know, from the state agency, it was okay. Screen your students three times per year. For those students who are identified as having and possibly being at risk and use the diagnostic assessments for those students. Um, and I said, well, if there's so much testing, like what are you using? You know, what are the tests that you're using? Because I know how many are required, but what are you using? And we did an analysis and I suggest, <laughs> kind of recommend that you look at what's required in your buildings or in your, in your um, districts. So I asked the principal to just create this chart list all of the assessments in one column, list all of the assessments that are being used. In the next column, list what these assessments or these screeners are assessing, right? What are the components and what type of data are you trying to, to get from your students? Um, and then after that, list the grade level or grade band that is impacted by this assessment. And then lastly, list what it is you actually do with this data. Right. So the superintendent came back with this list and she said, wow, you know, we're we're using this assessment for this purpose, but there's also another assessment that we're using for the same purpose. And I really don't think that all of this data is even being used. It's just being collected. Right. So you have to make sure that you are testing with intention. You know, and at that moment, she said, OK, well, I see for next year, we don't need to renew these contracts with these specific vendors because we're really just testing to be testing. Everyone wants to have this, this great tool that someone in another district is using and they're, all, they're making these gains, but you have to identify the best tool 
that can give you the information that you need. So early identification is crucial. You have to go test with intention. Next, communication. Uh, making sure that we're communicating not only just with our parents and families, but others in the school, in the um, district and community. What are we trying to accomplish here? What is our focus? I've been into so many schools where the environment, as soon as you walk in the door, you know that their focus is on literacy, not just for reading, but for math and for science and for social studies, that literacy is their focus. So we have to communicate that. And if your state has a law, you have to make sure that you're educating them on what that means for their children. And then next, individual reading plans. Now, you know, there's a lot of cases where it's like interventions gone wrong, right? You know, where teachers put students in front of computers um, and they say, well, this is your intervention time for today. Now, interventions, especially if you're going to be using a computer, you must pair that with opportunities for teachers to provide, to stop and provide those interventions, those teacher-led interventions with their students. And interventions, of course, can be in small groups and all the other uh, opportunities that teachers may have to provide interventions. But are you tracking these interventions? Do you know what's really working? So what individual reading plans do, which really are part of the entire multi-tier system of supports, is that it allows teachers to um, say, well, for this student, I am going to provide interventions on uh, you know, letter naming fluency, or I'm going to provide, you know, you know, other specific interventions for this student. And then you're going to check back and progress monitor and see if the interventions are working. That's when you know and you make decisions as to how to um, change course and then provide other interventions that may be more effective. And then lastly, there are some states that have third grade promotion or retention as a part of their literacy laws. And Mississippi is one of those states. So how do you focus on prevention over retention? And I'll say this, for, for those of you who are administering universal screeners three times per year, know that your first administration of the universal screener within the first 30 days of school, you already know which students are at risk for reading failure. You already know that. You can put your finger on those students it's not about a percentage of, well, this teacher has 10% of her students or this teacher has 20% of her students. You know if Kimyana is at risk for reading failure. So the goal is how can we ensure that by the end of the year, beginning in kindergarten, that our students who are identified early are provided with the supports and the interventions that they need. So these are the components of a comprehensive early literacy policy. And these are the components that we used here in Mississippi. And so I wanna show you some data. And I want to be very transparent that not in, the, in addition to the Literacy-Based Promotion Act being passed, this was also during the time where we adopted beginning around 2010, 2011, we did adopt the Common Core State Standards that we, of course, Called, now called College and Career Readiness Standards. There may be some of you who also can't refer to them as Common Core, um, but our College and Career Readiness Standards. And we begin training teachers on that. Also during this process, we adopted an assessment that was more aligned to NAEP, that was more rigorous. You know, our state chief, Dr. Carrie Wright, would also say that we were, Mississippi, was a poster child for the honesty gap because the assessment that we had before, it was showing that we had all of these students that were proficient or all of these students who were doing well, and then students would be tested on NAEP and it showed a completely different story, right? So then we had to be honest with ourselves and adopt a more rigorous assessment that reflected the expectations um, that we should have for our students. So those things were also happening at the same time we adopted our Literacy-Based Promotion Act in 2013. And as you can see from our NAEP results during that time, we were at a scale score of 209. Our promotion and retention component of that policy went into place in 2015 um, with our third grade students. But then our fourth grade students are the ones who scored 214 during this time. So we had a significant five point skill score jump uh, before promotion even went into place with our fourth graders who were second grade, of course, in 2013. 
how did this happen? Why did this happen? For these two years, these students were exposed to teachers who were being trained in the science of reading. They were being exposed to teachers who had been trained on more rigorous standards. And then also we were beginning to host parent nights and really to begin to bring in our parents and families across the state, right? Of course, as the years went on, and this is the nation um, in blue, uh, we began to have those slow and steady gains until, of course, in 2019, uh, we, for the first time, met the national average. Now, these were our national rankings on our NAEP gains. I think it's important for, for us as a state to talk about how we were able to achieve these things. Uh, but I also think that it's important right now in, in kind of the aftermath of the pandemic to talk about how we have um, still a long way to go. Um, and that during the pandemic, it was, it was something to see. And I will say that, you know, as far as being able to pivot to online instruction, we weren't ready for that. A lot of our communities were not ready for that. If you know anything about the makeup of our state, and some of you uh, may have the same makeup with your rural areas and with difficulty with broadband and all of those things. So we experienced all of those challenges um, and we were able to identify from there where other gaps were, where our already existing gaps were and where other gaps were. When our children are in classrooms, we know that we can, for, to some extent, control that. But when they're not, and when they're learning from home, whether it's synchronously or asynchronously, there are other factors. But because of these rankings, we know that we can do it. And we know that we've done it before. We know that we can do it again. And one of the important things also to consider is that in 2019, our low income Black, White, and Hispanic students outscored their peers nationally. So that dispels you know, any notion that because of a student's race or because of a student's um, a family's income that they can't learn to read. So I hope that this just serves as motivation um, for those of you who are leading in areas where, you know, it's kind of like when they say that you've been kind of written off, you know, or leading in these areas in your communities to know that these things can happen and that they can take place and our students and our communities will be better for it. So I'll just talk a few minutes about these points um, in response to NAEP and again, Although we reached a milestone for us, we were still with the rest of the country with a, just a, a small percentage of our students um, who are proficient. As you know, in 2019, there were only 35% of the students across the country who were uh, reading at or above NAEP proficient. So a few points to consider that these struggles are not just limited to Black and or Latino students. Um, and that there are, there are lower performing students from a variety of backgrounds. And what we do know is that the pandemic um, has worsened that. Not could have, but we know that it has worsened that. And if you've read the Amplify data, you know about the hardest hit grade was second grade and also second grade black students, right? So we know that there's a lot of work to do. And, you know, this is everybody's problem. Educating our children is everybody's problem. It doesn't just start in third grade. It starts, of course, before students come to school, but this is our kindergarten, first, second grade teachers are supporting our children along the way. So now let's talk about how literacy leaders matter. In this, um, this area, I'm gonna just really talk about um, these three ways of uh, three areas in which you can provide support as a literacy leader. Some of these things I've talked about in Mississippi's journey, but other ways that you can do these things in your schools, in your buildings, in your district. And the first is how are you going to support your teachers, your strategies and supports for teachers? Of course, providing their professional development to teachers and administrators in the science of reading using your instructional coaches, modeling and co-teaching in kindergarten through fourth grade classrooms. And I did include fourth grade. Uh, you know, there are so many instances in where 
teachers are alternate route teachers. I am an alternate route teacher. Uh, I didn't come through this profession uh, initially. Um, so I know how in my training that I was not taught how to teach children how to read until I got my doctorate. Um, in early childhood education. So we have teachers who will go through the alternate route and they are sitting in fourth grade classrooms and they have not been exposed or fifth grade classrooms. And of course, you know, as you go on to middle and high school. So making sure that this is available, this type of professional development is available and that coaches are able to not just coach your K-3 teachers, but also in many cases, your fourth grade teachers as well. Next, okay, your standard staff meetings. How can you turn those standard staff meetings into POCs, into your professional learning communities that not only focus on building content knowledge, but also curriculum knowledge and analyzing your data? Adopting a professional development in the science of reading is not going to uh, cure it all. When you're adopting new curriculum, uh, and one thing that we found out here is that as our teachers began to know more about the science of reading, they were coming into classrooms or coming back into classrooms that did not have materials aligned to what they were learning. So that is something else to consider if you've made your adoption of your uh, curriculum. How does it align to now this, this science of reading training that your teachers are attending? And they'll be the ones to tell you, well, you know, now I'm, I feel like I have to pull other resources because this curriculum doesn't line up with what I've recently or the, the new information that I've learned. So as you're adopting your curriculum, make sure that you're adopting the professional development that goes along with your curriculum that is aligned to the science of reading. Professional development on how to teach, how to do the scope and sequence, how to use other supplemental materials, and how to just follow the agenda or just the flow of the curriculum. Teachers also have to know that as well. So make sure that you are including that. And I always say that your agenda reflects your priorities. Whether you're a school board, <laughs> school board, school board member, or, or leaders, or you're a principal that has the staff meetings, whether before school or after school, your agenda reflects your priorities. Make sure that you are allowing opportunities for those rock star teachers that you have to showcase a strategy. It can take five minutes. It can take 10 minutes that you're focusing on strategies for how to teach reading, especially if you do not have an instructional coach. Make sure that you're building teacher leaders in your classroom. And of course, uh, the last thing in, in ways to support your teachers is ensuring that they have access to their high quality instructional materials. And so how do we support our students? Again, we must focus on early identification, um, those screeners, even of course, flagging those students who may have um, characteristics of dyslexia. And that's the, that's the first step, you know, um, especially kindergarten teachers. I always say that kindergarten teachers are rock stars. Other teachers are rock stars too. But with kindergarten, our kindergarten teachers are receiving students who are coming from other pre-K programs. They're coming from Head Start. They're coming from home. Uh, they're coming from childcare centers, uh, which of course, as we know, may vary in degree of quality. So when all of these students come into your classroom, you can't just start on page one, or you can't just say, we're gonna all learn letters. You have to identify where students are and then begin to um, um, focus on providing those interventions for students at risk. And then of course, the, the administer the diagnostic assessment. And I think we just kind of take for granted sometimes that teachers know how to administer these assessments uh, and that they know how to read the data. We need to make sure that it's not checking off a box to say that, okay, I've done the screener, I've done the diagnostic, you know, here you go, I've, I've done that. That they have to have the training, okay, so now, what now, what next? Um, and then next, that individual reading plan that I talked about by documenting exactly what you're doing so that you'll know what's working and then of course, what's not working. And then of course, monitor students' progress. Now, for parents and families, um, there are principals now who have started having their PTA meetings, their parent-teacher meetings via Zoom. 
and that it has become much more successful than sometimes asking parents to come to PTA meetings after work, after they've picked up their children, after they're trying to find dinner or cook dinner and those types of things. So they're getting more participation uh, from parents with our new, just kind of our reliance on technology um, that we found can really be a part of our outreach to other community members who may have otherwise not been able to attend certain meetings. So of course, provide the outreach to promote um, the parent engagement and of course their involvement in any type of interventions or, or reading plans that you are developing with their children. Notify parents and families early and often. You know, there are too many times where some parents say at the end of the year, well, I just found out. You know, I didn't know that my child was doing this poorly, or they see that there's just a, a C or a D or something on the report card, and they just say to themselves, well, you know, I know that my child's not going to make all A's, but at least it's not an F, right? We have those parents in our communities who want the best for their children, but what they know is that at least my child isn't failing, but that still doesn't mean that the child is, is proficient and is where they need to be and is on level for where they need to be in order to be successful. And so you have to provide those resources for parents. In many cases, you can't just put something in the child's backpack or send an email or tell parents to check <laughs> their child's grades online, right? We still have to have our old school, let me reach out to the parent, let me call the parent, or let me uh, you know, try to set up a meeting with the parent to say, this is the area in which your child needs some assistance, and these are some strategies that you can do at home. Um, there are several sites. I know for Mississippi, we have strong readers, strong leaders, and there are several sites that have resources for parents. They've broken their state standards down into parent-friendly language. And you can't just say to a parent, again, that your child needs help in phonics. Many parents may not know what that means or what that looks like in their role of helping their child. So you have to provide those opportunities for that and provide parent nights and literacy nights and such. And so, of course, discuss the impact of school attendance on reading proficiency. We have school attendance officers. We have outreach. Um, and I've read so many articles that are asking, where are our students post pandemic? And again, I, I keep saying post, I'm in this world that I'm, I'm hoping that we're, we're past it now, but where are our students? So many students did not return. So many families have moved. So many family dynamics have changed as a result of losing loved ones to COVID. So we have to discuss the impact of the school attendance, especially on reading proficiency. And we have to be able to provide the type of outreach to our parents uh, to, to just really talk about the importance of their children being present um, for school. Now, um, this is from INSIL, from the National Center on Improving Literacy, and I just kind of tweaked it a bit. Um, as you continue to talk to your parents uh, and also lead your staff and, of course, report out to your school board or whatever type of um, combination that you have in, in your school district. In some cases, schools have to report to their school board when they're talking about data, you know, school leaders. So these are some just the key questions that parents want to know, that teachers and administrators should be able to answer, and that of course the policies should reflect. What are the practices for literacy um, in your school? Are you just screening students one time per year and just saying, you know, now I've identified students and I'm going to go ahead and provide instruction? What are the screening and practice, screening practices? How do you progress monitor? How do you make sure that you're keeping up with the children uh, and their progress? And how are you identifying children with reading difficulties? Is it just through teacher made tests? Is it just through you know um, district developed tests? You know, is it just for nine weeks? How are you identifying children with reading difficulties? Um, and and again, are you using these high quality screeners? Uh, next. 
what about the evidence-based literacy instruction? What are interventions, right? Uh, what types of interventions are you using for my child and how will I know if these interventions are working and will I know when there's progress uh, that's been made or if a child has uh, regressed or if there hasn't been any movement? What information does the school collect? How is this information used to make decisions? What types of supports are offered to students who are struggling? That can vary from district to district and even within district, depending on the type of support staff that schools may have. One school may have tutors or family volunteers, whereas another school may not. Some schools offer after or before school tutoring, whereas other schools may not. But parents and families want to know this. Teachers should be able to answer this. How are we addressing um, these these um, issues. And then lastly, what accommodations does the school provide to help my child? Now, one thing that I don't take lightly that, of course, we know is happening across the country is the fact that there is an exodus. Not just an exodus of our teachers, but an exodus of administrators, an exodus of superintendents. And we all say, okay, well, now we want to do all of these other things. How are we going to ensure that asking teachers to do all of these other things is not going to be the thing that runs our teachers off? The things that tells that says to our teachers, you know what, it's just too much. When you think about these practices or these asks, right, you have to think about and communicate it in a way that these are things that are going to make teaching and learning more efficient. You have to really review what you are doing and understand and communicate that what you're trying to do now is that you want to do what you're doing better. That this is not in addition to that. That this is not, we don't want teachers to have to go on websites to find all of these other resources. We want that to be in the package that we adopt for our curriculum adoption in our school and in our district. So these are things that we have to be able to communicate to our teachers and to our leaders is that we want to do what we've been doing better. And in order to do that, you have to make the shift into the science of reading instruction, also the materials that we use. And you probably can't read this from where you are, uh, but of course this is from Lead for Literacy and for literacy leaders, what do you need to know? Um, and, and all of these things that we have discussed, which are, you know, what are the priority reading skills? It is so important for leaders to know this. There are so many leaders who have come from middle school, high school, where they did not come through the teacher preparation program. And, and even again, like I said, for those of us who may have, then you weren't taught to teach reading this way. So as the lead learner in your building, you have to know what the priority reading skills are and how these are interwoven to come to skilled reading. How to support your teachers with implementing this evidence-based literacy practice. How do you do this in a way where it's not overwhelming? Because it can be overwhelming. If you're making a transition to a new curriculum, give yourself a runway for that. Provide the professional development for that. Too often there are districts that are July 1, they make the decision to adopt a new curriculum. And in August, they're expecting teachers to begin teaching from it, right? How can we make these types of decisions early and provide ourselves and our teachers the runway to become familiar with the curriculum, to go through uh, professional development, to be able to uh, watch others who are presenting these lessons? Let's make sure that we are supporting our teachers with implementing these strategies. And then lastly, how to evaluate, prioritize, plan, and implement an effective reading model. You have to know what's working and you have to know what's not working. In some cases, there are schools that do all of these different things and they make gains. And then next year, they don't even know exactly what it was that they did. So we have to begin to document what we're doing. You know, as a leader, as a reflective practitioner, you have to say this year, this is the model that we're using. Because guess what? If we begin changing things in the middle of the year, our teachers will also get frustrated. If we say, oh, wow, well, someone else in another district is doing this. So for the second quarter, we're going to shift to doing something else. So we also can't do that. We have to make sure that we are 
going through the process and that we're documenting what works. So I will end with this, be the change uh, leaders, change your culture, change the culture in your building to those that, you know, I know that teachers are competitive, <laughs> leaders are competitive, schools are competitive, you know, we want to be the best you know, but we also have to begin to open our classroom doors and we have to begin to allow teachers to see other teachers who are doing this thing uh, right and who are making games with children. Change the culture of your building to where uh, everyone is teaching and learning at the same time and change the perception. Change your perception of what it means to engage with your school, uh, for your parents and for your other stakeholders. Ensure that they know that this is a welcoming environment and that you need them in order to support their children, your students, in order to make those gains and improve student outcomes. And then reject the blame game. You know, I've been on several sides of the table where I've also worked at a um, university. You know, the university uh, may say, well, you know, our, our schools, our public schools or private schools are they're sending us children who aren't ready. So many children are having to take remedial courses when they come to college, right? And then the school system may say, well, you're sending us teachers who aren't ready. You know, teachers who aren't ready to teach children how to read on day one. So we have to reject the blame game. And we have to begin to see ourselves not as separate entities, but as K-12 and higher ed all in this continuum because we need each other. We rely on each other. Um, recently, Tennessee and North Carolina, when they passed their laws last year, they included higher education in their literacy laws. And they included that as students exit your programs or within your courses, you must teach the components of reading. You must teach uh, the candidates how to administer these assessments and um, you must teach them how to read the data. So it has become a trend now that we're including higher education in this conversation. And it is extremely important, again, that we all know that we're all in this thing together and that we cannot blame one or the other because children are sitting there and they're looking at us and looking to us to make the right decision for their future. And this concludes my presentation. And I will turn it over to Brad. Thank you so much, Dr. Burke. We appreciate your knowledge. Um, I wish every leader, literacy leader could be in the room with you right now um, and gain and expand their knowledge. So we appreciate you very much. Um, there was a handful of questions that we had in the chat. So I'd like to throw those into the space um, if you're okay with that. Sure, let's go. Thank you so much. So the first question is um, about second grade reading data. I think it's um, amplified data you referred to. Why yeah. do you think second grade was the hardest hit so far? <clears throat> oh, think about it. These children were, uh, in kindergarten, they were uh, trying to finish kindergarten that year and many of them went home for spring break that March and never returned, right? And so during this time, that entire, their first grade year, they were learning online. This is when we're teaching children how to um, hold their mouths, how to think about the positioning of their tongue, of their teeth. A lot of these things are done face-to-face -face with children sitting across from the teacher. Uh, a lot of it, and you know, and I think we take for granted that type of encouragement that teachers can provide when children are in the classroom and just that nudge or that pat on the shoulder to say, okay, you can do it. Those types of things are also lost, you know, when you're trying to communicate online. And then the follow-up, you know, expecting parents who, for some who may have not been working at the time or for those who were essential and had to go to work, Who's now going to reinforce these things at home, right? When the child gets off the computer, if the child has logged on to the computer. Uh, so many other things, but I really do believe that, that the, our second grade students uh, were the ones who were really hit hard as they were just beginning to, to learn how to read. Yeah. And yeah. it's, a, it's a testament to the power of explicit instruction and the, and the mm -hmm. need for it at that young age. And they just did not receive it and the impact of that. And so. And manipulatives. Yeah. You know, and the manipulatives that are used in the classrooms, the felt squares, the, the uh, shaving cream, you know, uh, yeah. all of those things that our students need in order to connect with what they're learning. Um, uh, it's just, 
we could talk about this all day, but yeah. it's really, you know, so many, so many things that, that students just didn't have access to. The timely feedback necessary, yeah. especially at that, you know, age, it's just was harder in a virtual setting. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, can, how or what can a non-educator advocate do to help this movement? I thought this was an excellent question because we play roles as educators that sometimes we may not play those roles. And so how can a non-educator right. advocate fill that role? Of <clears throat> well, you know, a lot, of, a lot of these movements have started at the grassroots level that have bubbled up and then the state or the district is saying, okay, let's, let's take a look at this. Uh, you know, a state like Colorado just passed the transparency law um, where all school districts must post on their website the curriculum that they're using. I think attending conferences like this, of course, learning more about um, what the science of reading is, learning more about all of these different components that should be in place so that we can hold our schools accountable. Accountability goes both ways. You know, we want to make sure that our children are doing their work. We want to make sure that our parents are, are, are providing them with what they need to do it. But also with our schools, you know, we have to also be very transparent and accountable. So I think that uh, for advocates, for those who are not educated, just asking the right questions uh, and learning more about it. And then, you know, legislators, there was a, a child yesterday, I was, I testified in Louisiana, they have two early literacy bills, so I was there, and there was a child that um, had spoken to her legislator, her representative, and she talked to him about this bill that she wanted, um, so that to ensure that, you know, teachers who may be, um, who may have been arrested or have something pending that they get a full uh, background check and other things before they're able to come back into the building so that children can feel safe. And the legislator brought that before the committee yesterday. I mean, so I don't think that we, we understand the power that we have with these types of connections and you know, we vote and we put these people into place and they are representing us. So I think that we also have to know that we can go directly to the school and we can talk to our principals and, and leaders about these are some things that we want to see changed. But then we also have representatives and, and, and school board members and, and other connections like that where we can advocate for change as well. Absolutely. Um, I know that also an organization of International Dys Dyslexia Association, every state has, you know, a branch of that. Oregon has a strong branch of that. It's pushed legislation here. Um, get involved with those organizations and they will, they'll embrace this movement. So yes. that's a way to get involved as well. And we'll throw that in the chat. Um, so next question is about how do we, you, you, you made this mention of bridging learning and professional development to practice. Mm -hmm. What could you say would be like one of the number one things we as leaders could do to make that happen as one thing that comes across your mind that we could all do to make that bridge happen sooner and quicker and stick? You know, I mentioned it in, in your staff meetings, you know how there's always this meme, and I know it's no one on here where they said this staff meeting could have been an email. I know that that's none of you here. Uh, <laughs> but when you have your audience, when you have your teachers there, it, there really could be a quick 10 minute lesson, but guess what this requires? This requires for the administrator, and I know that administrators are pulled in all of these different directions, but I've met administrators that said during the reading block, I'm unavailable. If there's a call from a parent, you know, unless something is just, there's an emergency, I'm unavailable because I'm in classrooms. And, and, and you have to make that type of commitment to understanding what's going on in your building. And again, the professional development to know what you're looking at, <laughs> right? When you're going in there to observe, but also it's so powerful when you go to your teacher and say, you know, hey, Brad, I saw you do this lesson. Do you mind showing the others just like a quick 10 minute, you know, just kind of presentation as to how they can do that in their classroom? And you're building confidence, you're building teacher leaders, you're getting buy-in, right? Mm -hmm. And then because Brad is a popular teacher, right? They're going to say, wow, if Brad is doing that, then I want to do that too. So th and that costs nothing. Right. So I think that ways in which you can really uh, ensure that that transfer from, you know, we've all gone to PD and gotten a binder, you know, and put it on our shelves and no one has asked us to do it. They don't want to ask what we learned, you know, any of that. But I think this has to be we have to have our pulse on this along like every step of the way. I know you went to professional development or I know you've been online with professional development. 
What did you learn? You know, I'll give you all a couple of weeks to kind of get comfortable with it. And then I would like to see it in classroom. And that's extremely important. Please do not ask someone who went to professional development Monday where, hey, I'm coming in your classroom Thursday and I want to see what you learn. Give them that type of cushion to where they can, of course, talk to colleagues or just really kind of perfect it. And then again, put them in the spotlight, you know, uh, let them let them do that in front of their colleagues, but use that time with your audience to always uh, build a teacher up, but then also let them show what they're doing so other teachers can learn from that. That's excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Another question that we have in the chat is concerning high quality screeners. Mm. And I know this is a concern of yours that you've had to battle um, in your state, and it's a concern that we have as well. So how do we choose a high quality screener? And what, how would you direct a leader um, in, to explore that? And is there a resource you would recommend? Okay, so, you know, I can't advocate for certain vendors, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but there has to be, of course, the components of reading. You're looking at your phonological awareness. You're looking at, uh, of course, when you're, when you're thinking about uh, also screeners that may screen for characteristics of dyslexia, you're, you're making sure, you know, the spelling or the encoding and, you know, your decoding, all of those things, that you're looking for all of those components, but that you're also looking for uh, a screener that just follows really the, the IDA guidelines when you talk about screeners, that it can be quick, that it can identify those students you put from one group to another, whether they're at risk versus those who are, who are not, and that it assesses for all of these different skills. You know, there have been states that have said, okay, we've adopted a screener, but it only screens for these two things, two things, right? And, and we have a screener, so what's the problem? <laughs> you know, uh, but you have to think about what type of information do I need from this screener to make instructional decisions? And I and one of my colleagues who's amazing talks about, you know, there are assessments of instruction, like your end of year or your summative assessments. It just kind of says, okay, you know, Kimyana did her thing this year. Let's see how well are her students perform. And then there are assessments for instruction. So making sure that you're choosing those assessments that give you the data to make those types of instructional decisions, whether it's for your whole group or whether it's small group and interventions. Um, the former uh, RTI for success, I think it's MTSS for success, I believe now, um, has a list of screeners and they have, of course, your validity, your reliability. All of those things must also be taken into account. Those are things that, you know, I'm reading that math, you know, but you know, you don't want to think about all of those things, but all of that is extremely important um, in choosing the right screeners. And again, don't uh, screen students with multiple assessments that are screening for the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. We want time for instruction. Absolutely. Um, David put into the chat as well uh, a link to NCII and their evaluation tools for screeners. So that's an excellent tool to, to dive in and to explore this a little bit further. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think the last question is, is kind of this, is about professional learning and how we can keep the conversation as leaders focused on the need for professional learning and not get it like conflated with programs that say like, letters or this route, like how do we truly keep the conversation about our teachers need to increase knowledge? How can we do that together? And how does it avoid the, the getting it caught in the battle right off this off the bat? Okay, so I think Good that, he, yeah, 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 great question. I think that, um, you know, there, there are some districts have their professional development plan like for the district, if you have your district days, you know, you have to go to this professional development, you have to learn about this system or these things. But I think that as leaders, our professional development plans for our schools um, must be fluid, must be flat. There are going to be some things that you may have this great calendar and say, oh, for this week, we're gonna have this pill. But there are gonna be some things that you're gonna have to respond to. And I think that as you create that culture uh, with your staff to say that as I go on my learning walks, you know, or as teachers talk to me about their difficulty in doing those things, understand that, you know, this professional development plan or what we have for week 10, that may change based on some things that I see in week seven and eight, you know, and that that is really responsive and that is what's needed for teachers 
like you said, the overall knowledge, yes. The overall, we have a new curriculum. Uh, all of, we have to learn how to use the parts. That's fine. But also, there are going to be some instructional needs that have to be responded to, and that the that the school leader has to be able to say, "I hear you. I see you. Uh, this is not just an issue in this classroom. I see it now in this classroom as well. So let's take a moment so that we can clarify any misconceptions. Those are the same things that we want to do when we're teaching our children when they have questions. And I think that's the same thing, same way we need to treat professional learning. Like we're really responding to the needs of those who are, again, I always say invest in people, invest in teachers. Uh, we're responding to those who are standing in front of kids every day. Thank you. Great You're message. Welcome. We appreciate it.